This conference will now be recorded. Can someone please confirm if the screen is visible? Yes. Great. Fine. So, uh, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, so, today's topic is traditional business analyst versus agile business analyst. And probably before we do a deep dive, I would just like to introduce myself. So I am Ipshita, the speaker for today's webinar. Uh, I have around 15 years of experience as a business analyst and out of which it's eight plus years uh, completely into Agile. And currently I'm playing a role of a product owner in one of the product companies. And this is about Tech Canvas wherein again tech canvas is, has associations with a lot of uh, institutions like you know they're partnered with iib canada and isq germany and are their training partners so they provide uh, training in business analysis automation testing domain trainings and other stuff seleniums and all so that's about tech canvas as such so probably without wasting any further time, I would want to directly get into the, the, the today's agenda, which is agile versus traditional business analyst. And maybe after the end of the session, we can take up all the questions. You guys, if you want, you can add your questions in the chat box. And once we are done with it, uh, we will I will just go through the questions one by one. Yeah. So typically something that we all know, like whoever is working as a business analyst or probably are, uh, you know, want to become a business analyst, we all know what a waterfall model is or a waterfall method is. So it's been there since ages and a typical way of gathering requirement in a waterfall methodology has been like as business analyst, we probably would spend three to four months uh, with the customers. We go to the customer's location, talk to them, gather the requirements, spend a couple of months gathering those, write down pages of documentations in terms of business requirement documentations, functional specifications and stuff, the BRDs, FRDs, etc. Get them signed off from the customer, come back to the team wherein probably the designing happens, the technical architect would basically do the designing, decide upon the technology stack, and once the complete designing is done, then we would start the coding phase wherein the actual implementation would happen. Once the implementation is done, then is a testing phase wherein probably system testing, integration testing, everything would happen. And in between that, we would also have the UAT, which is the user acceptance testing. So if you see the step-by-step -step flow, once the requirements are gathered, the role of a business analyst in a traditional model sort of is disconnected. And probably during the UAT phase, again, the business analyst would come into the picture uh, doing the unit testing, sorry, doing the user acceptance testing. And finally, things would go live and then probably the maintenance and the operational support. So this basically has been a typical waterfall method, a sequential approach that has been there in terms of you know our sdlc life cycle software development life cycle so it's like uh, we finish every specification before starting a new one so that's why the term waterfall because you finish one step and then you move to the other but there were a couple of drawbacks basically when we when with this approach and with the current market scenario if you see where requirements keep changing every now and then so the complete waterfall cycle like for any particular project starting from requirement gathering to the you know go live probably would take six months or even more than that. And by the time the product is completed, the product is launched out in the market, the requirements probably have drastically changed or probably there's no need for it at all. Maybe my competitors have launched a similar kind of a thing, a similar kind of a feature in between. So whatever, as a customer, I had thought of, things have drastically changed. And this eventually, you know, have led to a lot of 
effort being utilized to create this flow, a lot of probably resources, a lot of uh, financial budget. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, things are spent in this particular model. And then eventually after this thing, when you realize that, okay, requirements itself has changed completely, then it's basically a loss for the company itself. So because of these, this major drawback, Hence, probably, you know, people these days do shift for Agile because Agile is, as the name itself suggests, it is Agile. So, you know, you can incorporate changes anytime during any of your phases. And also another drawback that the sequential life cycle had, the waterfall model had, is like nowhere in any of these phases after, like, after the requirements have been gathered, none of the other phases, probably the customer is there in the picture or the stakeholders come into the picture. So they would directly come into the picture during the UAT phase by the time all your development has completed. So there is no point or no option for the customer or the stakeholder to validate that, okay, whatever the requirements are, the product is being built accordingly. So that also has been a, another drawback for the waterfall method or the sequential method. And that is one of the main reason that company software companies these days are moving from waterfall to agile, because there are some valid problems with waterfall as you can see that you know the customer's involvement or stakeholders involvement is absolutely not there and there is always a risk of changing requirements every now and then now typically like we just go through a basic uh, waterfall methodology what all we do so requirements in waterfall methodology are gathered in the form of use cases right so maybe some of you are already aware of it but we'll just quickly touch base upon these points so what use cases are so it's like typically a written description so we have the template out there again this is just a template based on your project probably you can add or you can remove certain things you can modify the templates so it's absolutely up to the organization and the project team that you are in so basically use cases gives a description of how the user from a user's point of view how the tasks will be performed and the how the system basically will behave to it and it, these are basically represented in the form of you know sequential steps from like basically how a typical user goal is fulfilled in the form of different steps and accordingly how the system is going to behave so these are basically a very uh, step by step approach of how the system behavior would be now a typical way a typical example i would say like you know a login flow so that can be written in the form of use case so like when a user probably enters the email address and the password how does the system behave so that particular flow can become one use case and accordingly we can fill up this template based on how the system should behave now, when we talk about use case, there are a lot of elements which can be a part of the use case. The first and foremost are the actors. So basically the end user who is interacting with the system or behaving with the system, then there can be stakeholders as well, like you know, someone who has uh, some interest on the system behavior. Again, these are optional, not necessary that you have to have all these elements onto your flow. There are primary actors as well, like, you know, who basically, if there are, if, if the system is quite complex and if there are too many actors associated with a particular flow, then probably you might want to have a primary actor who is basically initiating the interaction with the system. Then typically preconditions can be there, which talks about any kind of events, which probably is required for this particular event to occur. Triggers is basically any event which causes this particular event. And again, there can be a, a basic flow, which is basically a happy path or you know, use case wherein we know that this is the bare minimum flow or the basic flow that should work. And there can be alternative paths mentioned as well, which is like, okay, some exceptional flow or some alternative flow to achieve the same thing. So you can have these kind of elements as well. However, one thing to keep in mind is like, 
when we talk about use case so it's basically uh, who is using the website what the user wants to do what are the user goals steps to accomplish the task and how the system should behave so these are the things which it, these are included in the test case a te uh, sorry a use case however a use case will never tell you like what your probably technology stack should be that shouldn't be a part of the use case at all or probably any details about user interfaces or screens so these are not included in a typical use case but then a use case typically gives you a step by step flow of the user and their interaction with the system so use case is has been very much extensively used in a waterfall model next again since we were talking about the requirement phase of a business analyst in waterfall one of the major requirement or the documentation is the business requirement document or the brd so this again provides the scope the business needs the problems that needs to be addressed for the complete project and again there can be you know different kinds of uh, templates as well for a brd again depends from different business or depends from the different stakeholders that you are using but brd is the first step whenever a business analyst gathers the requirement so the brd has to be signed off to start any kind of a project in a waterfall model so it gives you the complete specif specification of the project what are the business needs and how you are going to achieve however brd will not go into a deep dive about what screens there should be or what modules there should be it's a high level document talking about what the what is the scope of the project what are you going to achieve and probably you know the business need is what we look for the next step is the next another type of document is the functional requirement document or the frds so this is a detailed version of it so probably once our brd gets signed off and probably we get the project then we start you know this formal documentation and detailing the requirement in a much more detailed format basically you know how the system should behave so the the system behavior what are the tasks what are the functions and again on on a typical functional way what different modules probably you know the system should have and you know you can pick up different flows you can even add a lot of mock ups and screenshots in the functional requirement documents so functional requirements are more from a functional perspective and probably a very much in depth document which talks about the functionalities that the typical system would have and of course it is much more detailed and much more comprehensive than a brd so these are very common documents and again the important ones which in a waterfall model uh, or any sequential model if you go with you probably will have to do it and based on it probably you know the project gets signed off and stuff like that now moving on to the next now we'll talk about agile so you know what actually agile is again in agile there are different forms of it but agile on a high level talks about you know you pick up a set of user stories or you pick up a set of tasks work upon them demonstrate it to the stakeholders or your customers get a sign off and push it to life so it's like frequent incremental release is what agile is all about so the basically the drawbacks that were identified in the waterfall model so those drawbacks have actually been you know worked upon here in the agile method wherein you are basically you know doing and working on requirements in a very smaller chunks you are trying to develop them you are releasing those and of course your customer is always updated on the progress so the two important bits like you know which we said that the problems with waterfall one is probably the timeline is so much in case of waterfall that the requirements would get changed so agile mitigates it by you know doing very small deliverables probably a two week release cycle or maybe even less as a one week release cycle so that the timeline to release a particular feature is really less in agile 
And the second thing is, uh, unlike waterfall, the stakeholders or the customers are always available. There are different meetings which are there as a part of Agile, as which are called as ceremonies or you know, scrum ceremonies, which are attended by the stakeholders and they are aware of the progress and they can always give their early feedback and which is very much recommendable. So typically in Agile, if you see, so we have a product backlog, which can consists of requirements. Requirements can be in the form of user stories. So we'll get into it in the upcoming slides about what user stories are. So requirements can be in the form of user stories, any kind of technical tasks, any kind of defects probably you want to work upon. And those requirements, which are there in the product backlog are always in a prioritized order. So if the items in the top of the backlog are the ones which are of the highest priority and stories are pulled from the backlog they are probably elaborated and defined uh, mainly by the business analyst then it gets into the coding phase once it is done it gets into the testing phase and then finally the acceptance testing so if it passes so i mean to say like if the story is tested well and it is approved by the stakeholders and your product owners, you push that story for the release to the business unit. If not, because of any probably any kind of reasons, if the story is not being accepted, in that case, it gets into the same cycle again. So you again start elaborating the story, you again start the coding, probably things which you have missed, you rework on them. So it's a continuous cycle. And it is an iterative kind of a module or an incremental kind of a method. So you build small chunks, you push it to life, you get feedback, you build again. So that's the goodness of Agile. Now, where exactly does the business analyst come into the picture? So as you have seen in Waterfall, probably the business analyst will come into the picture the first requirement gathering phase and towards the end of it when the UAT happens. But in case of Agile, the business analyst is always prioritizing the stories in the backlog. So they keep the backlog ready, detailing down the stories. So, you know, in terms of creating the stories, getting requirements from the stakeholders, also, business analysts would sometimes accept the stories on behalf of the customer or the stakeholders as well. Just a moment. Right. And the next part is the business analyst also provides support in testing because you know he or she is the one who knows the requirement end to end so of course do not they will not sit and you know follow test cases line by line and do the testing but they will do a round of exploratory testing just to ensure that whatever has been there in the requirement has that actually been met so if you see unlike in the traditional approach in case of waterfall there is also a constant way or the you know the business analyst uh, is always involved in the complete agile cycle or the agile flow so the involvement of the business analyst is always there right the next we'll just talk about scrum because uh, scrum is a very common methodology which is used in agile of course agile has different flavors it has scrum it has kanban it has extreme programming uh, but scrum is the most popular one uh, so typically what happens in Scrum is like, of course, we have a product owner who is, again, a product owner can be a person from the customer side. He or she can be a stakeholder as well. But if you're working for product companies, a product owner can be, uh, you know, a typical person who owns the product completely. So depends on which kind of setup you are in. But typically a product owner manages the product backlog and the business analyst with the help of product owner will basically detail down the stories and coordinate with the product owner to have more understanding of the product as such. So since I was talking about, you know, the different ceremonies or the different meetings, but in the customer interaction or the stakeholder interaction is there in case of agile. So sprint planning is one such meeting. Wherein uh, in the sprint planning meeting, the product owner, the business analyst, 
the entire team and any stakeholders from the customer side would be present. The user stories, which would be worked upon for the sprint. So sprint is basically the iteration, the typical cycle that we saw in Agile. So this iteration can be a two weeks iteration or even a four week iteration. Again, depends on what your organization setup is or what kind of project you are managing. So typically in the sprint planning, this user stories or the requirements have been uh, detailed, detail, you know, explained in details. If there are any questions raised by the team members, those questions are answered. And typically the team members in consent with the business analyst and the product owner would basically agree to work upon a list of user stories in a two week sprint. So that's basically a common meeting where everyone is present, which of course has a lot of transparency as well, because you have the entire team from the development side, as well as the stakeholders present in that meeting. And there is a very healthy discussion that happens and all the requirements and everything is understood and the team commits that, okay, in the next two weeks, we would probably work on these five features or these five requirements, for example. And then those five stories or those five requirements are nothing but your sprint backlog. And of course, you have someone called as a scrum master who is basically a facilitator who uh, mainly works to ensure that, you know, the team is able to work without any impediments or, you know, there are no challenges faced by the team members and they are able to work freely independently. So that's basically a role of a scrum master. Like in case of any leaves, probably any of any of the resources or any of the team members, it's the scrum master's responsibility to accordingly, you know, decide upon the velocity and the capacity of the team. So that's what it is. Now, once the sprint starts, you see, you know, the, that's this design phase, there is this development phase and the testing phase, which is again a constant, uh, you know, it's, it's a vicious circle, which keeps happening for each and every user story or each and every requirement that has been picked up. And as I said, so it's usually from two to four weeks of a sprint. So it's like five to 30 days probably. And side by side on a daily basis, there is something called as a daily scrum or a daily stand up meeting, which also happens. So again, this is a typical meeting where you would have your business analyst, your product owner, your stakeholders probably, and where each and every team member would update on what they have done yesterday, what they are planning to do today. And in case they are having some issues or some impediments, they would highlight them. Because the time duration in a sprint is so less. And because of course we are looking for, you know, incremental and fast delivery. So it is very important to give the status on a daily basis so that everyone knows what the situation is. And probably if, a team member is really stuck with some issue or some problem, he or she can seek help from others. So there's again, this meeting, which is quite transparent enough and the, you know, the exact status of the development is being provided to the stakeholders. And once probably your sprint is completed, the last day of the sprint, we have the sprint review, which is nothing but again, a common meeting where everyone is present from the developers team, and the stakeholders, the product owners, the business analyst, and the stories that or the requirements that the team has worked upon during this two weeks sprint, for example, are all demonstrated to the stakeholders to get their feedback. Because as I said, so the main objective of Agile is you work, you work on smaller chunks, you get the feedback, you again, probably do an incremental work. So that's how it is, so that you can do a faster delivery. So once the stories are reviewed or you know, demonstrated in the sprint review, if there are certain feedback on the stories, probably if the stories are not accepted, then they would again get back into the same cycle. Maybe they'll be added to the next sprint or probably into the backlog to be prioritized later. The decision is to be decided by the product owner. But if the stories are accepted, they would actually be added to the product increment. And then again, as we said, so it gets on to the incremental release. And there is another set of meeting that happens within the team, which is called as a retrospective meeting. 
So once the sprint is over, the team themselves would, again, uh, the product owner or the business analyst can also be present in such meetings, wherein the team retrospect ab for, about themselves. So what probably they have done well in the sprint, what did they feel that had did, that didn't go quite well? If there are any improvements that the team feels, you know, that can help them, or any improvements which probably they can apply from the next sprint cycle, which will save their time or you know, save their effort, they can actually discuss about those and take a conscious decision of following them. So a sprint retrospective is something which is for the team's uh, you know empowerment or team's continuous learning. And in case of agile, if you see, you know, the complete process or the overview that I gave, so the team empowerment is quite prominent. So the team decides what, you know, they are going to work upon. Of course, the scrum master is there to help them out. Uh, also, the product owner is deciding upon the features, but the team themselves will pick up the stories or the requirements. The team does the retrospective to understand how they can improve themselves. So the team empowerment is something which is very much uh, prominent and quite given a lot of importance in agile methodology. So that was about the scrum. The next bit we will talk here is about a user story. So typically you have seen that in a traditional model, we do write use cases, right? So here, we do not follow a lot of documentations because Agile uh, says that, you know, rather than spending time on documentation, they probably would prefer a working software. So that's what it is. So typically we depict work the requirements in terms of user stories. And a typical way of writing user story or a template is as a user, like it can be any kind of a user. So it can be any user who's interacting with your system that I want to perform some tasks, some activities of, you know, how you are interacting with the system so that I can achieve some goal, benefit or value. So what is the benefit probably you as an end user would get by interacting with the system? So this is a typical format of writing a user story. And user stories also have something called as acceptance criteria, which defines like, you know, sort of a checklist or sort of pointers, which tells that, uh, basically you know what all uh, pointers or what all criteria probably will ensure that the story is completed or sort of testing criteria also you might call them as so that's how it is so that th that's a typical way of writing user stories and in terms of requirements how are they broken down so you would probably have a theme theme is nothing but a very high level feature Right, because as I said that in Agile, we are working on smaller chunks, something which can be doable in a week or two weeks to four weeks time, right? So again, if you're working on a full-fledged feature at a time, that will never be achievable. So of course, you need to highlight what the feature is, what the theme is. So probably you are integrating a payment gateway into your site. So that is a theme. From that theme, you can have multiple epics, which are a little larger set of work not as big as a theme but probably a medium range of work so maybe when i talk about uh, if a theme is basically a, a payment provider you know you're integrating with the payment provider epic can be i'm integrating with uh, probably uh, paypal i mean integrating with uh, card options and stuff like that and when I'm breaking that epic into multiple user stories, it means that these user stories can be done in two to four weeks of time based on the in, in any one sprint, basically. So you're breaking that into more small, smaller chunks. That's how it is. And again, once you have the user stories ready, you can break them into smaller tasks as well. So we, the main idea is to break the requirements into smaller chunks so that it can be basically doable or it can be done by the team and in the short time range of a sprint. Now, typically, again, a, a way of agile versus waterfall. So what we have already spoken about is like everything is sequential in case of waterfall. So right from the conception, initiation, analysis, design, construction, testing, deployment, everything is a step by step process. Unlike in Agile, wherein there is a continuous cycle, so every step is interlinked. So 
you know, even the initiation, the analysis, everything goes hand side by side. And we are working on smaller chunks of work, smaller chunks of requirements. We work upon them. We release them out in the market. We again start working. And deployment is also on a continuous basis. So it's nothing is sequential or step by step in agile. Everything is in sort of a cycle or in a continuous mode. So that is the main important thing to understand here. Now, typically, when we talk about business analysis, right, a way that IIBA defines business analysis is it is about increasing the delivery of business value to the stakeholders of the project or the product being developed. So anything that you do to increase the business value. So any processes you can follow, anything like Agile doesn't give you any kind of checklist. Anything which is which you as a business analyst feel will be helpful to the team and you think you can add value, you can always follow that. So there is no checklist, there are, there are no you know, typical uh, methods or typical ways that it says. It is like anything as a, you know, because again, things keep changing based on the different teams that we work in, based on different organizations that we work in. So anything as an individual you think is going to help the team to deliver better or to add value to the project that you're working, you can always in, implement those things. Even when we were talking about user stories, right? So typically, we know what the format of user stories are. But if you really want to add some more details into it, because you think that that will help your team members, always feel free to do that. that nothing actually stops you from doing it. Now, here we will basically talk about the scope of business analysts. So in typically in an agile method. So it's basically once we start our career as a business analyst, for example, maybe we just one year or you know one to three years or max to max five years of experience in the industry, you would see that you are more into you know, gathering requirements, doing analysis, doing documentation. So this scope, what I'm talking about is in general, it is not related only to agile, but this is like in general to any business analyst as such. So you are basically doing this kind of an activity when in your initial step stages of your career, right? You're mainly into, you're assigned a particular project and you work for that particular project or the product. Next, when you move, sorry, Next, when you move to a little higher up in the hierarchy, wherein your organization impact is also a little higher, so probably now you are maybe seven, eight years experience, you do understand the organization better and you do come up with a lot of processes like, okay, which will basically improve the projects that you handle right or probably a lot of projects that you handle so maybe you become a senior business analyst and you have some business analyst under you so you do come up with a lot of processes which you feel is going to add value to the organization as such and next probably much more higher level where you basically contribute in the you know on an enterprise way so you do a lot of SWOT analysis you're doing you know value propositions you're doing your uh, you know our product strategy and stuff like that so at this point when you are thinking on the enterprise improvement you think from an organization point of view so here probably you do a lot of pre-sales activity to get projects for your company right for the organization that you're working on you think how probably you can increase the ROI for your organization or for your enterprise. So your step-by-step, -step, your contribution towards the organization also increases as and when you move up the ladder. So that's a typical way of how you as a business analyst can contribute into your organizations. Now, again, moving into the Agile BA topic, seven different principles which are very important. Uh, to keep in mind when we think about an agile and you know having that agile mindset is very important. So first and foremost thing is think as a customer. So when I say think as a customer, the word customer here is not your client or your stakeholder. The word customer here is the end user. So you have to think from an end user point of view who will be interacting with the system. So here comes a lot of usability aspects as well, the UI UX bit. Probably you will have to think from those different angles. So it's just not 
like a traditional method probably you would just talk to your stakeholders just write down pages of requirements and come back that is not going to happen so you have to inculcate a lot of thought process within yourself and one of the main foremost thing is you have to think as an end user who will be using the product so probably if you're adding a particular feature why am i doing that what value add probably that particular feature is going to give to any user who is using it so you have to think from that, that aspect and try and question out people the next thing here is analyze to determine what is uh, valuable so you are basically analyzing to determine what is valuable in terms of the features so which feature of course if you are talking to a stakeholder or probably getting requirements they would give you so many requirements to work upon right but you have to analyze you have to understand and determine which are the features probably are most valuable because you are doing short term development right in case of agile so you need to understand the the requirements and prioritize them based on the value adds get real using example so it's always easy to explain things to the team as well as stakeholders when you have some examples in your hand right and that's a human tendency to explain things through an example so whenever you're explaining it either to your team or probably to your stakeholders it's always good idea if you have some examples or if you are able to you know something which the team is able to relate to avoid waste typically a lean principle and very much well known in agile is right you know anything which you feel any process that you feel is not adding any value to your you know to the agile way of working you just avoid doing that you need not spend time probably in documentations if you think that these documents are not adding any value because the moment you do documentations it is very important to maintain those documents and most of the time in practical cases we do write documents but when things gets changed when probably you're working on a change request or probably there's a change in requirement we don't remember to update those documents so eventually they become like a dead document lying down somewhere and you know that's actually a waste in that true sense the next one is understand what is doable so as a business analyst you know your team the most so you know what your team is capable of so probably when your stakeholder says that okay i want this feature and if you know that okay probably my team do not have that particular skill set so are there any different ways i can you know satisfy the same need of the stakeholder in some other way so understanding that is also very important so understand what is doable and then commit right if you think that probably it's going to take more time because your team do not have that particular skill set so you have to understand that and accordingly communicate to your stakeholder again simulate collaboration and continuous improvement that is a very important thing because you have to collaborate with your stakeholders and that is very much feasible in agile because you have always you know different kinds of say meetings you have your daily stand ups where you can talk up, you know on the status you can even have informal you know just random calls with your stakeholders if you really want to discuss any particular issues with them so there's always this collaboration that happens and continuous improvement is like as a business analyst it's you also need to learn a lot you have to keep yourself updated with the latest trends that's happening in the market it can be in terms of the ui ux it can be in terms of probably you know anything new technology that is there in the market and keep yourself updated so that you know you can add value in some way or the other and the other most important thing is see the whole so see the whole picture so as a business analyst you need to understand the whole picture so when your client or the stakeholder says that okay there is a requirement for doing a particular uh task or a particular feature you need to understand the whole picture in a true sense like okay what benefit will the organization ha have if this feature is there how it's going to help the customer how it's going to help your stakeholders so understand things from the complete end to end a 360 degree angle is what is required so these are basically seven principles again very uh, like for a typical ba and these are prescribed by the iiba code so if you guys have seen the iiba syllabus so these are the seven principles of the agile ba and i i guess it's not only for iiba 
probably anybody who is working in an agile environment is something that they need to follow. And as I said, so you know, the, the typical agile business analysis is again broken down into two different steps. One is the discovery framework, one is the delivery framework. Because a business analyst is involved into the delivery also in case of agile. So couple of ways how you can deal with it like probably when when you're in the discovery framework you can apply these principles as see the whole think as a customer analyze to determine what is valuable so these things you can use again no hard and fast rule you it all depends on how probably you know your practical situation how you're dealing with the stakeholders how you're working with them in the delivery framework you can get into you know you can apply these principles like get real using examples while you're explaining the user stories or requirements to your team understand what is do uh, doable you collaborate with the team continuous improvement and avoid waste so you can basically divide uh, your principles accordingly based on whichever framework you are working on as business analyst now typically uh, you know, a uh, difference between the mm, traditional BA and an agile BA, something that probably we all are aware of, and we might have spoken a lot, uh, you know, in our discussion as well. So I'll just quickly go through it. So again, requirements in case of a traditional way are in the form of use case, business requirement, functional requirement, even you sometimes have uh, UI specifications as well. For Agile BA, it is more in the form of epics and user stories. Use case, we do not do it that often because use cases are more prominent in uh, traditional method. For a business analyst in a traditional way, again, the focus is to complete the requirement, right? So the main uh, target for the business analyst is to write down requirements, get the requirements. But in case of an agile BA, it is more of understanding the problem and providing solution to it. So it's like you basically think what problem the stakeholder has, and maybe you know you can give them a couple of smart solutions as well, rather than building something they can actually tweak their legacy system and that might help them. So providing a smart solution and understanding what the problem statement is, what an agile BA is expected to do. For a traditional BA, because they have probably you know three months of a time frame to gather requirements, their main focus is to get the requirements signed off, because their stay during that particular you know customer location is also limited. In case of agile, again the focus is to understand the business needs. So even if the requirements are being changed in the middle of the sprint, or probably you know there are some changes that happens probably the priority is different and suddenly the stakeholders wants to have a different priority altogether so the focus is basically to understand you know what the business needs are and uh, in case of traditional again the there is always a gap so as i said so the business analyst there's always a wall between the business and the development team right however in case of agile like you have the product owner or the biz agile business analyst is always a part of the team itself and they're always ready to help the team in case they need any help in case they need any clarification on any requirements the next bit again when we are talking about the difference couple of things which we have to keep in mind that in case of an traditional method because the requirements are signed off at the initial stage the features are fixed you cannot play around with the features at all because the requirements are signed off so what we do is like we make the time and cost flexible or variable sorry because it's like you know the time range can keep extending because i might say that okay probably we didn't realize this and in the design phase we missed this and we are extending the time since we extend the time we extend we increase the cost of the project as well and eventually what gets compromised is the quality because at one point of time you will have pressure from the stakeholder as well to finish the work and then eventually you know by the time the delivery the the coding is completed and it comes to the testing team they have very less time in hand and then they start compromising with the quality things are not tested properly and there is always a mess being created however in case of agile 
your time is variable because you can have uh, you know sprints ranging from two weeks to four weeks so you are always playing around with the time your cost is also uh, sort of uh, sorry it is fixed because my usually the sprint time is fixed as i said so from two to four weeks of a sprint cycle is what you usually follow you are fixing your cost because of course your time is fixed and you are looking for incremental releases your quality of the product is also fixed because you do not compromise with it because the time and cost is fixed. So accordingly, you can plan the testing as well. So the only thing that is variable is your features. So you can play around with that. Sometimes what happens on a practical sense is like, suppose as a team, I have committed that, okay, I will finish five user stories in a sprint. However, because of certain reasons, right? Technical constraint, anything. Instead of five, I could just do four user stories, so which is absolutely okay. The fifth one can be, you know, added to the next sprint, or you can discuss with your product owner, and then you can, in fact, get that into your product backlog and later on get it prioritized. So there is, so you always have that flexibility to play around with your features, and we do not compromise on the quality at all because everything is fixed in case of agile approach. Now, since we said, right, that we are doing incremental releases, right? So what is it and how like the, you know, the time to market is really small, short in case of Agile. And that's why the term minimum viable product is quite uh, popular these days. Now, when I talk about minimum viable product, so it's like the bare minimum features of the solution is what you want to release out to the market, right? But it's like something which is minimum, which means the bare bone or the bare foundation of the solution, viable, which means it's sufficient enough for the end users to use it. And the product is something, you know, which the end users can basically, it's tangible enough, which they can play around with or they can use it. So that is what the main thing is when we talk about minimum viable product. So maybe rather than waiting for, six to eight months for a you know in case of waterfall rather than waiting for six to eight months for a big bang release to happen you can always go for an mvp option wherein probably you would do the release in two to three months right the minimum viable product you build your product you measure your re re results you improve the product and you again work upon it so again this becomes a cycle wherein you're doing incremental releases and you are also sure that you are building something that the customer wants because the first phase of the product is already, you know, the MVP is already out in the market. Your end users are using it. You're getting feedback from them and then you're making the incremental release. So you are, you know, you're actually building a feature which the customer wants or the end users wants. So this saves a lot of uh, saves you from a lot of uncertainty. You are probably with limited effort or limited resource, you are building small incremental things. And of course, there's a lot of value add when you apply this kind of an approach. Now, typically, the last phase that I would want to talk about here is like a typical question that is very common in like, how do I decide what way or which methodology to use, right? So the key factors that determine right methodology, like which method should you use for the project? Should you use waterfall or should I use agile? So how, what are the things that basically matter here? Again, there can be a lot of factors. Some of them I'm able to jot down, but practical things are very different than probably what we read on books. So there can be other things as well. One is the project focus. So basically, what are the tasks involved, right? What your project is basically aimed to provide. Sometimes, you know, uh, it can be a sort of a back end kind of a work where there is no user interface probably, or probably, you know, uh, you need not have that kind of a stakeholder involvement because you already, there's just a typical architecture change or some backend work, some DB changes, database changes that you're doing. So you might not go for agile in that case, you can go for a waterfall, a fixed timeline and a fixed bit kind of a project. Again, the other factor is the customer and stakeholder involvement. So how, 
willingly your customer and stakeholder wants to accept this kind of a method because your customer has to be or a stakeholder has to be available if you're following an agile methodology they have to spend time in the different agile ceremonies they have to probably spend every day for the you know the daily stand-ups which is there so how uh, comfortable they are in doing it maybe sometimes the industry also matters what kind of a uh, you know project that you're dealing with in terms of what kind of industry it is so based on that as well you you know you want to decide which method you want to go for then there is flexibility of timeline so if you really have a very stringent deadline maybe you know you just cannot think of doing agile at all because you know i have to finish the project in two months and there is no other way so in that case, you have to go for a waterfall. Same like if I have a fixed budget, I have to finish it within the X dollars or X pounds. So then again, it's better to go with waterfall, go with a fixed bit project. Again, the number and type of team working on the project. So the depends on the resources that you have, whether you can split that into a waterfall or an you know, agile team is something which is important the complexity of projects so sometimes the projects are really complex right you, and we are not even sure what the requirements could be so things when situations wherein you learn on the project itself something where there is uncertainty whether it will be accepted or not by the end users it's better we go for agile and not any other method again there can be resources needed versus resources available again typical situation is probably i need Python developers in the team, but I have Java developers, right? So how do I manipulate, mitigate that issue? So again, depends on the, you know, your project, your management to decide your probably your project managers to take such decisions. Scalability of the project sometimes is also a, a factor to determine, right? Like whether you'll be able to scale up the project or not, whether this incremental releases will actually help or not right uh, resistance to change now, again this is mindset so in the team do are the team members or probably even the management are are they willing to adopt the agile mindset because agile is all about a mindset because a lot of things will change so if they are willing to do that there's initially there's always resistance right so to overcome that resistance and adopt agile is something which is important Again, as I said, rigidity is also one of them. Then do you have specialization roles or do you have a product owner either at your end or at the customer's end? So you have to think of all these things. So typically when we say that let's go agile, it is just not a term that, okay, let's go agile. There are a lot of factors behind it and you probably it's not business analyst who's deciding it, but as a management, as an organization, we'll have to think that whether are we really in a state or in a, position to go agile what kind of project we, and it depends from project to project not all projects can be done in a waterfall model or not all projects can be done in an agile model so based on whatever is best suited is what we have to pick and work upon so so that basically and uh, brings us to the end of it so typically certain certifications agile certifications which if you are interested to go with the uh, agile ba you can opt for there are different kinds of institutions which provide different certifications i've just listed a couple of them and one more is tech canvas also provides a uh, agile analysis master certification course so in this course it's basically a six weeks course where in the first two weeks we will do the basic agile foundation and the next four weeks we will give you the training on the AAC certification so that you can appear for the exam. So typically this brings us to the end of the webinar today. I will just go through the chat box and address the questions. If there are more, please keep adding. I'll just go through them one by one. Okay will we get the recording i think so you will get the recording maybe you can just drop an email uh, to tech canvas and i i'm sure they usually stream it in youtube so you should be able to access the recording for sure okay can you explain how the frd indicates how the development team will satisfy the business needs whether the solution being so it is like 
the develop not the development team as such but basically how the you know uh, the product so basically how functionally how the satellite how probably the solution can be so maybe you you can show a couple of screens in your frds you can show how the interactions were going to be so it's much more detailed way of approaching it and of course when you are doing the frd we do at by the time we are probably you know detailing down the frds in terms of deciding the approach side by side on a very practical sense we also start doing the feasibility the technical feasibility as well in terms of what features you know what technology stack we are going to follow what technology stack we'll be able to integrate with a typical ui so those discussions anyways get started in our design feasibility phase so that's when you are basically creating the frds as well wherein you are basically trying to capture as much as system information from a product point of view and of course you in the frds you can also give your high level architecture or a low level architecture if it is ready so the high level architectures can be a part of it as well because on a very practical sense you have to keep things ready because uh, in case of waterfall your budget gets sanctioned the time you probably you know sign your brds right when you get the project so your cost is as i said so your cost in case of waterfall is sort of you know you at the initial stage you are just signing it off so that's the reason you will not be able to unless you have your technical architecture ready you will not be able to coming you know decide on what the cost probably will be okay uh, is it possible to try to organize this useful sessions on weekends i know that is true even i do prefer over weekends but yes we'll definitely pass it on this to the uh, tech canvas of course so isn't a product owner responsible for prioritizing the agile product backlog uh, a product owner is responsible definitely you're right but as i said a product owner can be a a, par, a person from your one of your stakeholders as well or a person from the team also so a product owner is definitely accepting the stories is definitely prioritizing the backlog but a agile ba also side by side has to be involved into it maybe if there is a product owner he or agile ba might not have the decision making capacity but as i said the seven principles of agile ba you should understand what the whole picture is so if my product owner is prioritizing one story over the other so why probably he or she is doing that to understanding that is a very important thing and these days you know to be on a very practical note these days when companies say that we are doing agile slowly slowly probably you know they even change the designation of business analyst to product owner itself so when you read any job profile of a product owner you eventually see that they are doing exactly the same kind of a role as a business analyst so depending on different organizations the roles or the work that you have to do is uh, do does change yes so i think tom is uh, kathleen has already answered that yeah uh, although not all organizations have product owner uh, yes it's a good next option right you're right okay do your bas have the authority to make decisions on behalf of business stakeholders so depends on how you know what kind of bonding probably you have again it, in some cases yes if you have a good rapport if you have a good understanding as i said you if you understand the product really well if you understand the customer need requirements really well you can definitely do it right so tom says that yeah these principles look like uh, the ones for yes you are absolutely right these are provided uh, by the iiba uh, of course product ownership as well and also the aac course so if you go through the iib aac course uh, advanced agile analysis they also provide these uh, seven principles or the seven guidelines also important to understand what is doable from the organization level it might not always be about the team can do but yes so doable in the sense whether the organization can support that kind of a you know activity how big the organization is what kind of resources probably they can accommodate so everything is a part of it
uh it is sort of a it's i wouldn't say it is spiral kind of a method agile but agile is more of a you know a very continuous cycle that we follow in agile which wherein we actually look for continuous integration and continuous deployment so we are working on small chunks getting it released out in the market get it getting feedback from the end users and working again so that's what it is i wonder if we would ever be able to go agile in a high exactly agreed as i said so pharmaceuticals again is has a lot of regulations and stuff so that's where you know your your the industry comes into the picture the rigidity and other stuffs okay human capacity for changing can your users sustain multiple releases exactly so that is also a very important thing is lisa out there is that means you would be a scrum master can you just elaborate on this if you are still there in the chat in the list i don't think she is there i think you will get the slides i you can just drop an email to tech canvas for more details on it so savita wants to see the scrum master process once again so i'll just just give me a moment i'll just take it at the end okay how do you manage requirements for crs in case of agile so as i said in case of agile change requests are not managed separately so if there is any change in requirements probably you would add a user story in the form of requirements and that user story would be prioritized so if it is something that needs to be done on an urgent basis right the change so that probably will be prioritized and added on the top of your backlog by the product owner and when your sprint starts that story can be added and can be done on a priority basis so that's how it is in agile we do not follow any kind of documentation or you know separate process to handle change requests because as i said if the agile name itself is like things are not things are changing the agile that's what agile is all about so when things change so it's like you know you capture those requirements you get it prioritized add it on top of your product backlog and pull it and that process is a continuous process that keeps happening okay gorov says that okay i am in the banking industry for 8 hours now i want to become a business analyst please uh, suggest of course you can and i would think that that's going to actually be helpful because you have good banking knowledge as well if you're there in the banking industry for eight hours so maybe you can do a basic business analysis course maybe if you want to go for the agile course you can do that get a certification done and that will anyways be helpful in your resume so have a basic understanding of agile how things work and if you're able to probably you know add some certifications onto your resume that anyways is always helpful so you can think about it and i would say that there are a lot of projects in the banking domain and if you really want to pick up the business analyst role that will help you also because of course you already have a good domain knowledge about banking okay So are there any other questions? I'll just go to the uh, slide wherein we did the scrum process and maybe if there are any further questions, just let me know. Can you? Yes, Savita, are you there? Do you want to ask any questions? I think hello can you hear me yes i can yes, hear you I now just wanted a print screen of the slide uh, it's okay the, thank you. yeah great great thank you. fine is there any other questions from anyone before we end the session 
so if you have any further questions right regarding tech canvas and the course i would suggest you just just please drop an email to them and uh, they'll definitely respond to you the last slide has the email address so uh, just if you have any or you can just contact them regarding any other courses that you guys want to take up and if you have any queries related to agile be or anything on the webinar you can add it here and i'll respond in case no one has any further questions okay thank you everyone thanks for all your time This conference will now be recorded.